Walking along a path at the roots of Pikes Peak, you take a fork in the road towards the Anselm Society Digital Pub. Inside is a raucous conversation on the arts, faith, and, well, the art of arranging flowers in your pajamas. In the corner by the fire are two people. One of them is arguing that, with more than a little self-doubt, that there is no such thing as spending too much money on flowers. And that's me, your host, Christina Brown. Welcome to Believe to See, a podcast of the Anselm Society Arts Guild. Here at Believe to See, we explore the relationship between faith, art, and storytelling. Our goal is to connect the great story with the great stories, and our own stories, so that we may better understand what it means to live with a Christian imagination. Today, we are talking about the art of homemaking, and how being intentional in our homes, in the way we structure our routines, habits, and design our surroundings, can center us in the grand narrative of eternity and help us to find our place within it. And with me today is my friend and colleague, Elise Westby, poet, homemaker, and Anselm Society member artist. Welcome, Elise. Hello. How are you today? I'm wonderful. How are you? Well, I'm still loving my, um, my, uh, argument on spending lots of (laughs) money on flowers. I definitely did that today. Um, but I was really grateful because I came in and my husband said, oh, no, you're fine. I was like, oh, thank goodness. (laughs) That's always helpful. (laughs) It is. It is. So today we wanted to talk to you guys about the art of homemaking. There is a way to cultivate beauty and curate a family narrative that draws the entire household into the great story. So we wanted to talk a little bit about the particulars and how that works and how it might not work. But uh, let's just start with a very simple question, Elise. Um, What to you does the phrase the art of homemaking mean? Sure. Well, I had never honestly really heard of the term until I read Edith Schaefer's book, The Hidden Art, which we're going to be talking about a lot today, I'm sure. One of my absolute favorites. Yes, I love this book. And, um, you know, I had actually never really heard of it until one of our beloved Anselm friends, Lanier Ivester, recommended it on her blog years ago. And, um, of course, if she recommended it, I'm sure it was, you know, going to be really good. So I went and bought it and I loved it. And so I've been reading it throughout the years. But Edith Schaefer really defines hidden art as minor art or the art of the everyday. Art that's not necessarily of your career or profession, but art that can often be overlooked. So to me, that's really what it means as well. Mm, I love that. Sometimes people really think that art is something for the elite, but they don't. Well, even sometimes I think it's something like it's a leisure, right? Like, well, I don't have time to go to my studio and paint, therefore I'm not creating art. But the idea of, of art in those hidden places and spaces in everyday life is actually incredibly important to um, being, I think I could argue, a, a Christian or someone who is living with the idea of heaven in mind. What do you think of that, first of all? Oh, I absolutely agree. Um, You know, I think, and I'll talk about this more later on as we go, but I think it's so important, you know, it's so easy, especially as believers, to kind of overlook the opportunity of the everyday to grow resentful even or Mm. disappointed in the everyday. But we have all these chances, all these moments throughout our days where we really can cultivate beauty and where we can share that with our own heart, with the heart of our family, with the heart of you know, just people who are passing through our lives, coming to our homes, visiting, that sort of thing. So I really think it's, it's the vast majority of our life is made up of these everyday moments. So I think it's really important to recognize that and to take advantage of it. I think I would like to speak a little bit into um, beauty because you, you use the word beauty. And of course, it's, it's, it's a big word, right? But it can be used many, many ways inside right. the home when you're, when you're using it as, as a guide for cultivating a narrative. But when we create the narrative of beauty, it's a story of our Christian life through beauty. It's order and rhythm, and it directs our souls towards God in a more holistic and holy way. Mm. And I've really come to experience that myself over the years, for sure. 
but I really wanted to kind of dig into some ways that you have done that in your home or that you aim to do it. Um, I know you're a mother with some small children and husband. Um, and I know sometimes it can be different to do it with, um, with children or spouses um, or by yourself. But I want to hear about your specific experience at the moment. What is it like for you, Elise Westby, to cultivate um, a narrative of beauty in your home? Wow, that's a, a good question. With four, four children, our home is never tranquil. It's always loud and there's a lot going on, a lot of activity. But I really want to create in our home a place that's inspiring for them, um, a place where they are surrounded with beauty. Um, to me, like interior design and decor is very important. Um, I want them to, to almost feel like they're living in a dream. And I know that's like very idealistic thing to say, but I want them to see beautiful art around them and hear beautiful music. I have books all over, beautiful books that they're welcome to look at and to read, you know, to eat meals that not only bring us together, but they enjoy and they're delicious, so all of those things. Um, and I think of the word too, I, I was thinking about this earlier, the word shelter, like it's kind of got a negative connotation when someone says like, oh, you're sheltering your kids. But if you actually think of the word shelter, it's simply a safe place. Mm -hmm. You know, and I want to create that for my children, a safe place, a place where time perhaps passes a little bit slower, a tucked away sort of secret garden place. And I think of it, too, as even a harbor where we go out of into the world and then we come back. And where even others who are visiting, maybe, you know, they can come and tuck into our harbor for an evening and feel encouraged, feel inspired by beauty or the conversation. I love that you say tuck into our harbor. Yes, yes. <laughs> lovely. I love it. Um, and even chiefly, like I want the Lord to feel that our home is a resting place where he can abide. So there's a lot of different ways you can cultivate that beauty or that inspiration. But I think that's something really important. And then, you know, on another note, it's something kind of fun that I do for just myself really is I love clothing. Mm -hmm. And so... In this you know, moment in time when I do have four children, I, I can't necessarily go and write for hours a day like I would like to, <laughs> but I really take delight in finding outfits that I enjoy, that I appreciate and putting together cool, you know, cool outfits that I can wear, even if I'm at home or I will be honest though, some days I wear my pajamas or like yoga pants far into the day. Just to arrange <laughs> so, yeah. flowers, you know. You know. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm not, not all perfect with that, but it's better to arrange flowers in your pajamas. Yes, yes. I'm just going to keep saying that. Yes, I think so. You're more creative when you do that. <laughs> That's right. Um, more relaxed. <laughs> yeah. Your creative juices can flow better. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I love clothing too. So that's kind of, you know, every day you get a new palette or a new easel. I don't know. Not, that's not the right word. I'm not a painter. A new canvas. <laughs> a canvas. Yes. I'm not a painter. You get a new <laughs> canvas that you can decorate that day. You or know. cover up if blemishes are right. involved. <laughs> Put on a moo moo. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I love that too. That's kind of what I what I think about. Oh, that's so fun. No, I love that. I want to go back to that point where you said because it just it really pulled at my imagination when you said you want your children to feel like they're living in a dream. Like, can you tug on that a little bit more? Because I have a lot of thoughts. I've had similar sorts of conceptions, and I, I really do think that dreams have a negative connotation as well. Kind of like you said, the word shelter. But I think the Christian life is nothing without dreams. You know, I think if we can't dream, if we can't look towards something or long for something that's coming, um, and something as Christians we, we believe and have faith is coming, like, we don't really have anything to live for. Like, if, if you really go down that path, right, and say dreams aren't allowed, right, or, or they're silly, or, or, you know, where does that really take you if you go all the way back? So, yeah, tell me a little bit more about, like, that phrase when you said that. Sure. Well, I think of it, um, I think of it in the sense that, yeah, I mean, um, I do want my children to feel like they live in beautiful surroundings. And this, I often think about, this is our one life. You know, I mean, of course, we're eternal creatures. Sure, sure. But I won't get into that theologically, but this is our life. We're alive right now. Mm. This is our one time to live. Our Today is our day. And I really want to take advantage of it and not just watch beautiful movies or read beautiful stories and, oh, I wish, you know, my life looks like that or I had this beautiful English cottage or I <laughs> wish I had, you know, 
this beautiful flower garden like Christina has. But <laughs> I'm working on it. It's a work in progress. <laughs> but no, why not now? Why not now? Why not use my beautiful china today? And if it breaks, I'll go to the Goodwill and I'll buy another one and it's fine. But why not use it now? And why not wear my pretty dress today? And my kid might spit up on it, but it's okay. So kind of that idea of valuing today and giving dignity to myself and to my children, to us as people, that we're worth having a beautiful life even now. And we can live in a, that dream way right now. We don't have to wait for someday or just have it be a longing that we never actually put action. Right. No, there's so much value to that. Ways in which when we live our lives, we, we think, well, someday. Or when I save enough money, I will do X. Or when I have a big enough house, I will have people over for dinner. Or um, when I'm not living in a studio apartment, I will, I will have a garden party or something. And it's just, it's so easy to make those excuses for ourselves and you know, in a way, they are excuses. I mean, they're 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 longings, right? But they're they're also somewhat excuses, right? Yeah. We kind of want to, not necessarily excuses in the bad way, but you know, excuses in the sense that, well, I can't, I can't, I just can't. And so I think when we kind of open up our eyes to see, like you said, that yes, we we are living in the here and now, and though we do have a temporary life here, we are, like you said, eternal beings, and that is in- incredibly worth unpacking. And I know you said, you know, we wouldn't do it here. And it's true. We probably shouldn't do it here. But, but yeah, I think there is that idea that, right, if we are eternal, we are cultivating our gifts here on earth to take with us into the holy city, right? Someday. And that involves learning how to cultivate beauty, to be aesthetically conscious, to be um, aware that feasting is a good thing, right? Right. Um, And not just something that we do on holidays. You know, we can feast to celebrate anything. Well, and I think part of it too is we have to overcome a bit of fear. There's, mm. it's not normal, and so we stick out, and we can That's be, true. you know, we can almost in a way feel like we're opening ourselves up to teasing or to people not understanding, and oh, you're just a dreamer, or you know, well, I am, but that's okay. <laughs> like that's a good thing, <laughs> and I wish you were because it would be good for you too. <laughs> like, so being okay with being different, and I'm, you know. I'm totally okay with that. I'm used to it now. <laughs> um, so I think that's really important too. But I was thinking too, even as we were preparing for today and, you know, just like the value of the dreams, like the Lord, he was such a, a common, a lover of common things. I was thinking, you know, he played with the kids. He built wooden tables and he broke bread and poured wine and all these natural things. And his embrace of them, if we actually contemplate that, it's like he's embracing us and we, we feel his love and he's giving dignity to the common. He's giving worth and value to us. And so I think it's really important, you know, to, to, to ponder that. And, and then everything that's common or, you know, every day, um, it be, can become more dignified and more beautiful and more worthy when we see it through his eyes too, I think. Like worthy kind of in our own sense of self-worth worthy in that sense or yeah I mean just even in the sense of like he sees us as so valuable that we're worth putting in the effort to make things beautiful to to prepare a a beautiful space where we can reside as Christians we're called not to live in isolation of course so that means um, having a community around us whether it's building our own family or having friends or church communities over and around us um, but even just daily ins and outs of living. Basically, can you carve <laughs> carve out? Well, <laughs> since we're talking about carpentry, there you go. <laughs> into like if you had a table, you could carve a relief into what would be the story. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, um, if you could sort of carve out a picture for say a day in the life of Elise Westby, homeschooling her children regular old day what would it look like and how would you try to incorporate? is this reality or my my ideal day? <laughs> i would say why don't you mix a little bit of both because life is real <laughs> so how would i um live out that art in that yeah, day is that yeah. what you're asking mm-hmm, okay mm-hmm. wow well that's a, a good question um i think that it just in the beginning the normal mom stuff you know get the kids up you know serve them food um often i I am very non-techy, so I don't have a smartphone or I don't I don't even really know how to use one very well. <laughs> so I just have a good old fashioned radio in my kitchen and it's always sent to always set to the local classical 
station. Ooh. So, you know, when I'm cooking, when I'm doing the dishes, I just put it on and it goes right away to classical music. That's so cool. And so, you know, that's probably how, you know, I'm washing dishes, I'm making their breakfast, we're listening to peaceful classical music. And then we get started on our day, get started on our homeschooling. And that's a big part of, in this stage of life, um, kind of living at that art. And I'm so grateful for that. But a lot of the curriculums that we've chosen are very art friendly, um, are very much based on literature. And so we do a lot of reading aloud together of classical literature. You know, then there's like the part two where I'm like, go play outside, go <laughs> run outside. You know, Mama needs to break. Like, also, it's really good for you. <laughs> yeah. And, and also one big thing too, even with having four kids, I'm a big proponent of like tidiness. Like my house is definitely not always clean or tidy. But having that space, creating that, you know, beautiful space where things are picked up, where me and the kids can just enjoy our surroundings and not being overwhelmed by clutter, by mess, by all that. So that's like a practical art and tidying up. That's important. Um, And it brings rest to us. It helps us to be able to rest. I mean, there's tons of research done on how clutter causes anxiety. Yes. Yeah. And that's yeah. really interesting to me. Yeah. And then, of course, like there's the opportunity of artistic cooking. You know, some days it's not that great. It's just like <laughs> spaghetti again. I love to make breads. You know, like Ooh. that's always a really fun thing. And to bring it out to the table on a big wooden cutting board. And just to give the kids moments where when they remember their childhood, of course, not everything's going to be good or perfect, but they have these little beautiful touchstones along the way. Ooh, touchstones. I yeah. Like that. And they yeah. can speak to them and remind them all these beautiful moments and there's a reason why we have these beautiful moments it's pointing to something to someone do you find yourself talking to them kind of about why you do what you do or is it more like I just kind of want to imprint this on them and then as they grow maybe talk a little bit more or is it something you say why do we do this children we do this because we're looking to God and looking into his face, basically. Not his face, but that is such a good idea. I actually don't do that. And I should do that. Because otherwise they're probably like, wow, our mom's just neurotic and always plays classical music. And you know, they have nightmares in classical music. Hopefully not. No, I, I think that's the true monster is like Vivaldi narrating like, I'm like a dragon chasing no, a child. No, no, no more. Um, no, that's a great idea, though. I should do that. I should, you know, explain to them why or even, you know, preparing and presenting to them a beautiful loaf of bread. Oh, do you know who the bread of life is? Mm, Look at this yes. beautiful loaf of bread. Like, so, yeah, I, I should be more intentional about that. Well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's not that I, you know, wanted to like have any like kind of like, oh, you should do this. But it's funny because there is so much about like for me, like it's always a balance with my children between like mm-hmm. showing versus telling. Mm-hmm. And I think there's a delicate balance to that in life in general. And I think, I mean, if I were to venture to be bold and say, like, I think our Lord kind of does that too, right? Like he gave us the word, you know, he gave us scripture, um, especially revelation, but he also gave us general revelation. He gave us his image in each other, right? We look at each other's faces and we see God, right? Um, we see each other's behaviors, each other's hearts and, and our inclinations. If we were to just say, nope, and you can only look at scripture for mm-hmm. where you find who you are and your sure. story and your place in the world. I think it would like mislead us completely. I think it would completely not only miss the mark of the purpose of life, but we would lose entirely the vision of like, first of all, where we came from, but also where we're going in particular. The balance of showing versus telling, I find that to be really powerful. So yeah, I was just kind of wondering what it looked like in your home. No, I think that's really important. And I think even like looking back on some of my own story, just times where I've struggled like with mental health things. Um, and there were times where it was hard to read the Bible. And so having those moments where, you know, the Lord would minister to me through a beautiful song mm-hmm. or a sunset or things like that. So having that whole, you know, gamut of beauty that's speaking to us and telling us about him is really important for children too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I never want to be like the mom that, um, you know, it's always like a Bible thumper, you know, right. but, like, but yet my children live in a sterile environment where there's no beauty, there's no inspiration. And mm-hmm. I'm always just like, mm-hmm. go read your Bible, you know, <laughs> right. I, um, I want it to be a thing of delight and love. And yeah, no, I, I'm with you on that. And I think we're, the, we're lucky now that we're kind of living in a time where we're learning more about like the brain and how it works. Um, and we're learning that, that, that the brain does respond to stimuli, right? Mm-hmm. Whether it's a voice or a touch or a color, a texture. 
Um, and so we do see in, in, in science itself, you could say, God did kind of weave, to use that, that common word, like we weave all of that through the texture of creation. Right. Um, in fact, we were doing, um, we were removing a stump today, like I told you, like mm. earlier in our yard. Um, and it's really cool because I, I heard, I think I read somewhere, I think it may have been Andrew Peterson, but I, I will not misquote. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I had read from, from some gardener um, that when you actually put your fingernails in the soil, there is some kind of like chemical reaction that oh, kind of yeah. stimulates the serotonin in our yeah, brains. Yeah, the grounding thing. I've heard of people yes, talk about that. It's yeah. crazy. And yeah. so people used to just think like, oh, well, that's just symbolic. But like, wait a second. Yeah. You're like starting to discover that yeah. like, chemicals are actually kind of transferred. So um, anyway, all that to say, I really do think that that there is so much um, that's being shown to us as opposed to telling visuals and textures and and things like that to narrate part of who we are, not just because our personalities are different, but because God is huge and he encompasses all of us, right? All of our personalities and all of nature and changing of tides and seasons and all that stuff. Well, and it kind of is like that old debate of like the secular versus sacred, mm. you know? But like, I love that debate yeah. in terms of like, I love winning it. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> but it's just like, no, God, you know, he's the God of everything and everything can be sacred. Everything, mm. you know, when lived for him and towards him, you know, it can be holy. Yes. But I love that. Yeah. Yeah. No, I do too. Um, so let's talk about, um, I want to talk a little bit about people because we talked a lot about like you and I and our children and how we kind of want mm-hmm. to teach them and incorporate that with, with, with the way they grow up. But what about people who are either guests in your home or people who live alone and the only reason they would do any kind of aesthetics or homemaking that's, that's more than practical, right, is just basically for their own pleasure. And I know Edith Schaefer in her book talked a lot about that, which I just love. My favorite part, actually, maybe maybe you were going to say this, so I'll I'll let you talk first because oh, I, no, I know this go, is one go, of your favorite yeah. parts in in her book too. So, but yeah, so Edith Schaefer really believed like all that, and and I I totally love what she said. So, can you talk just a little bit about you know yeah what you see in that? Well, it's just like what you were saying in um, one of her chapters in Hidden Arts. It's her chapter, appropriately enough. But mm-hmm. floral arranging, <laughs> or floral, floral arrangements. Did she say that we should do it in our pajamas? Yes. Good. She did. Good. There's the authority. And slippers. And slippers. Uh, <laughs> no, but... And pearls. She, yes. <laughs> Always pearls. Always pearls. Always. But she talks about, like, um, how necessary it is that the person who is alone and living alone is very necessary and crucial for them to still create that atmosphere of beauty. She talks about how there's a neglected aloneness, or there's a cared for aloneness. Um, how she even goes the example of preparing like a little tray of tea and like some peaceful music, and and that atmosphere alone is almost like a respite. It's a time where you can just unwind and really have your soul be restored. Versus, oh, you know, not cultivating beauty around you and just feeling alone and depressed and. But you are worth it, even if you're alone, even if it's not for anyone else. I think sometimes there's that idea of like, let's restore ourselves and fill up our cups so we can go fill others' cups, you know, and empty it out again. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you're worth filling up your own cup. And even as a person living alone, you are valuable just as you are to take care of yourself, to minister to yourself almost in a way by yourself. And, you know, you will have lots of opportunities to be an outpost of grace and beauty is mm. how I like to think of it for like people that. who are coming into your home. Mm, mm-hmm. I think of, I have a, an amazing friend. She's so beautiful. And I love going to her home. She's a single lady and she wants to be married someday, but today she's lives alone, but she's cultivated such a beautiful home. Mm. She has fun, colorful art everywhere. And she always serves the most delicious food and we have the best conversations and afterward, I always go away feeling like a better person and feeling optimistic and hopeful about the world. And it's because she's created this environment in her home. She's not waiting for some day. Like today is worth it. Today is, you know, valuable. And so I really think that's important. Right. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that, too, because you said that's one of your favorite parts. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes, yes. No, it is. It's so it's so wonderful. I think. There is also that huge sense where, like, we need to let the Lord minister to our souls. And, and one of the primary ways he does that is through beauty. 
And beauty, of course, I also kind of wanted to touch back on this a little bit. When Elise and I use the term beauty, we're, be- we're using it very loosely. Yes. You know, <laughs> um, there, there's like a whole range of theological studies on beauty. Even when I'm writing about it, like I will often be like, oh, is there another word? Like I just, um, so it encompasses an entire range of, of, of things and feelings and um, perspectives on what is lovely and what is wholesome um, as far as edifying to your soul in particular, right? So that having been said, um, I do think because God um, is a God of beauty and a God of, a God of art, a creator, right? He wants to shape us, right? Yeah. Through that. And I think if we don't, if we think we're not worth it, right? Or it's like, no, my, my, my house is just going to be a place where I recharge, right? And then I'll just go out and do the good work. I think in some ways you're, you're not allowing the Lord to say, come to me and rest mm-hmm. ye who are weary, heavy laden. And so this, 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 the part of this chapter, I think it was this chapter when Edith Shaver was, was talking about when she goes to hotels, yeah. like she will bring a little tiny vase with her and she will just fly and the walk. candlestick and a candlestick yeah, and yes. a tablecloth. Yeah. <laughs> like even just like, even like a little doily, like, yeah. 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 Pack it in her suitcase. Right. <laughs> Just take it, and um, and you know she traveled a lot for ministry. You know her husband was Francis Shaver. For those at home who don't who don't know, um, who founded Labrie, and uh, so yeah, she traveled a lot for ministry. But Wouldn't that be funny going through security at the airport. <laughs> Why do you have a candlestick, <laughs> a tablecloth, and everything? Yeah. <laughs> because I'm playing Clue. <laughs> <laughs> I am Scarlet in the library. <laughs> oh. I miss that game. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but, but but like again, like that idea, like no one was in that hotel room with her, right? right? It was just her needing that sense of the Lord filling her and the peace and presence and beauty and um and again, yeah, going back to like how our senses are filled, right? By textures and colors and things around us. Like she really was um not just letting um like not just like self care. She wasn't just doing self care, she was letting yeah, she's letting God, letting beauty, um, letting parts of the world speak rest into her as she was traveling in strange places. Yeah, there's like a whole difference between like the quote unquote self care, which yes. can get really weird. Uh huh. Uh huh. Versus like what we're talking about. Yes, yeah, exactly. And a lot of it is the orientation too. Like we're looking at the Lord. We're mm-hmm. we're looking at His ways. Yeah. Um, and not you know. Yeah, it's different. Mm-hmm. It is. Yeah. And and. And trying to explain that, like, even in a few minutes is so difficult. And self-care is wonderful and it's good. And I think yeah. it's, it can be so holy and needed. <laughs> right. But, yeah, yeah. But there is this way where it's like, okay, self-care is great, but but where is the Lord? Where is the spirit in this? Where is the Lord sort of speaking that to your soul um, so you can grow in him and in who you are, you know, called to be, not just in this life, but in the next one. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Because you're a poet, and and I know I, I love to create poetry and write, so I, I like to think of, like, things this way. But I was like, you would be a really good person as a poet and a beautiful homemaker to think about if your home life was one large poem that could draw your soul and the souls of those who live with you nearer to our maker, either one day at a time or over the whole span of your life. How would you transpose it into the vernacular of everyday living? Okay, so this question I had to think a lot about. <laughs> I want my home and um, I want everything there to declare to to the world and to my family and to people who come in that all will be well. That's what I want mm, the poem to be. Julian of Norwich. Yeah. Yes. So that, you know, I thought about that, like that there is hope. That even as, you know, we see dark storm clouds coming ever closer and there's darkness all around us and things grow more dire. But each meal, each book that we read together, each beautiful song, that all of them are almost flashes of light that are reminding Mm. us again and again, day in and day out, that there is a hope and that all will be well. Mm. Um, and I think it's almost that builds that steadiness and that faith in us to keep going day after day, reminding ourselves. And I think too, even that, um, so much already is well because our father is with us Mm. and we have Mm -hmm. that hope even now. So to remember that too, that we can take joy even in today, even though things aren't perfect and the world is dark, we can still have joy. Mm -hmm. We can still eat this delicious meal and, and have fun as a family. Um, all, all is. 
is being made well and all will be made well. I think that would be what I want my home poem to be about. <laughs> I love it. Wouldn't it be cool? I, I, I think we should, I think we might need to attempt that. Okay. <laughs> we, we, we'd have to do a, this is my goal poem. And then on our deathbed, we'd say, now let's write the real thing. Yeah. Although I wouldn't want to look back and say, this Get is out a the failure. Red <laughs> Get out the red pen. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No. No. Get out the red pen. Yeah. <laughs> Strike. <Right. laughs> Strike, you're out. <laughs> what, what do you think you'd want yours to be? That's a good question. There's certainly, there's certainly a point, I think, where, I, I, well, I like to think of sonnets. Sonnets are like one of my very favorite, mm -hmm. you know, poetic forms. Because they do, like, they start and then they have this beautiful sort of body of narrative. And then they have sort of like this, this little moment of, of angst, right? Of, but there's a problem, right? And how are we going to solve it? Or is it going to be solved? Or maybe never. And then there's a turning point, right? And so I really love sonnets in the sense that, first of all, they're bite-sized, right? So you can actually, even for the non-poet lovers, like they can just be like, okay, I can read, you know, whatever it is, like 10 lines. Yeah. <laughs> but was it 10? No, it's 14. 14. Oh my goodness. That's okay. It's been a long day of digging up a stump. <laughs> digging up stumps. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Buying too many flowers. <laughs> Uh, 14 lines. I've got this. So I think it's interesting because there are so many, like I've noticed this recently, um, but there are so many uses of the word turn in scripture, mm -hmm. like turn to me. Um, you can also, you know, sort of think of that as the word come if you want to be extra, but turn from this, turn from that, turn your eyes to the Lord. Um, and, and I think there is that notion where, where life gets really, really hard. And it gets hard to be consistent and to be faithful and to keep acting as though there's something beautiful even when you can't see it or find it. And of course, that's in parenting. Sometimes you have no choice, right? Yeah. You know, you're like, well, God feed you. <laughs> but, um, you know, I got to clothe you. But, um, but yeah. And so I think there's that, that, there's that act of faithfulness that sometimes just has to be and we have to turn intentionally towards that hope. Yeah. But then even the turn, you know, and of course, so many sonnets were written over the ages. So it's not necessarily that all sonnets have like a particularly happy ending, but they all, all good sonnets, I think, in, in, in my humble opinion, do have a sense where, where there is a change, right? There is a good, there is a change. There is a turn. There is something that, that alters. Yeah. Um, but it, it like, it needs the body and the introduction of the sonnet to get there. Like if you were to just kind of say it, it wouldn't be nearly as rich as if you had read the rest of it. So like, if I were to die and just proclaim, I'm a Christian and I'm happy I'm going to see God, right? Um, the people who know me and hopefully, right, would have seen my life played out and, and lived to that end would actually want to go with me, right? Right. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. I want to go too. <laughs> So yeah, I guess that's kind of the sonnet that really drew me yeah. into that. But that's kind of, I was like, we should, we should just write one. That'd be yeah. fun. Yeah, that'd be fun. Pay attention. Show notes, everyone. It's yes. coming. Yes. It is coming. <laughs> Our future pub night. Future pub night. Oh, boy. <laughs> pressure, pressure. <laughs> is there, I know we're wrapping up, but we have a few more um, minutes, and I'd just love to, um, I don't know, just share some examples or ideas of times in your past and, and, you know, mine, if I can think of any, I didn't yet, but um, <laughs> where there was just a really, a really hard moment. You had mentioned some mental struggles and, but just times where <clears throat> we didn't want to engage, right? We didn't want to make something beautiful, but not just like something beautiful. Like we didn't even want to eat something that was good for us. Right. Right. Like we're just like, I'm done. I'm done with myself. I'm done with life. Nothing matters. Yeah. Where are some ways that, that we could encourage our listeners to, to fight back against that, you know, mm -hmm. and, and not just in the sense of like, oh, we have to be better than that, you know, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, because that's not what we're talking about. Like that is, well, personally, that is almost never what I'm talking about. Right. <laughs> that's, Same a, here. That's, a, that's a phrase I'm not a huge fan of. Um, <laughs> Same here. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So, so yeah, what are some things like just ways that, that listeners could really be gentle with themselves and love themselves and say, you know what? Maybe I could do that. Yeah, I mean, I think for me, like, and for anyone in that, in that boat, just to really think of, like, 
the Lord wants to nourish them, mm. you know, that they are worth being nourished. Mm-hmm. And and because you said maybe not wanting to eat something that's good <laughs> yeah, for you. Right, right. But there's all sorts of nourishment. You yes. know, there's that nourishment of what we actually eat, but even just like their soul being nourished mm-hmm. and their spirit being nourished and being gentle with themselves and and really knowing that the Lord is gentle with them. Like you said, like explaining your children, like this is bread, like the Lord yeah. is the bread of life. Yeah. yeah. And so, um, you know, like I had talked about earlier, like one big thing I want in my home is time to feel slower. Mm. And in, when you are in those moments where you just don't have the motivation or the ability to to keep going, it's mm. okay just to take a moment. You know, for mm. me, sometimes that's putting on some of my favorite, you know, soundtracks from movies I like mm, and just mm-hmm. letting that close my eyes and just let it roll over me. My and, husband loves that too. Yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. And, um, you know, just let that, it's very healing. I think, um, I've been doing a little bit of reading too about like neurological things and like in your brain and yes, stuff like yes, that yes, yes. and how there's those moments where you, you are unwinding and where you're almost letting your mind wander and daydream, how that's so important for your brain health mm. and it's okay. So sometimes when I'm like, I just can't, you know, some of my particular struggles are with OCD mm-hmm, and just, mm-hmm. I cannot think anymore. I cannot have any more thoughts. My brain is done. Mm. Well, okay, that's fine. Just go sit in a room. And or my favorite thing to do since I have four kids, I like to go to a park near my house that I always go to and just listen to my music mm. and do that for an hour. You know. Do you let the kids play while you listen while to the park? Well, my husband's park? babysitting, I should say. Oh, nice. Okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I live at home. He watches them. I go. Nice. Um, so I think for to encourage other people, like maybe your thing's not music, but mm-hmm. whatever it could be, like it's okay just to be gentle with yourself, to to find those things that do allow you just to to wander and to let go. And, and sometimes it's that act of trusting the Lord. Like I haven't quite figured it out. I haven't figured it all out, Lord. And, um, and I don't even know what the next step is, but I'm just going to trust you. And I'm going to take this moment and just sit in this moment and be nourished and you know, do practical things too, just taking care of yourself, you know, drinking your water and <laughs> trying to sleep. Like sleep is a huge thing. I know. Um, I wish it wasn't. But... I know. <laughs> Yeah, I know I have the bad habit of staying up really late reading novels and then I pay for it in the morning and that's so <laughs> I bad. I know. So bad. And you are nourishing yourself with story, but... But my kids still wake me up really, yes, you know. exactly. But, uh, yeah, so, so I think that that would be an encouragement I have, you know, whatever is someone's particular kind of restorative thing that they love, music or art or... Mm-hmm. or to, it's, it's okay to enjoy that and to let it kind of bring healing to you. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. For me, I think I love the word quietude, first of all, because it's beautiful. Mm-hmm. Yes, <laughs> I love to write. And I love wordplay. Yeah. Um, but, but I just. Is that actually a word? It is. I yeah, love that. Quietude. Yeah, I know. Great. Isn't that great? Yeah. I know. But I think I, I do. I, I'm so much a doer and I don't like to be still. I, I do love creating. I like making beauty and getting tasks done, mostly because I feel good about myself. <laughs> But um, but there is such a, a a grace to solitude, a grace in a growing and um, a quietude. But I think they're they're like the spirit speaks in colors and shades and songs and textures and um, quiet. Um, and it's so hard to still those voices. Just as human, we live in a very very turbulent age as far as. Um, stimuli, right? It's loud. It's loud. It's loud, yeah. Mm-hmm. It's loud and fast paced. But I think, honestly, like, there's always been a temptation in the human soul to, to ignore that place, right? That could heal us because it's frightening or it's, um, it's a pause. And we don't really know what's going to happen to us in that pause, right? Um, I even know um, people who reject beauty and things that are beautiful because they just have, there's a well of pain that just comes up. And I think there's just something there. And I think there's a reason for that. And yeah. beauty and things that are beautiful or speak to us or to others, the guests in our home, our children, it can sometimes hurt before it heals. Yeah. But there is such a, such an importance to that in being able to ground ourselves in who we are and who we're meant to be and who God is asking us to be, but just reminding ourselves we're not and I, I'm also thinking mental health here with you, like, yeah, right? Yeah. We're not floating in, in this, or, or even like an OCD, I have OCD too, like just caught in this constant questions and turmoil and turbulence and, you know, obsessiveness, really. Yeah, right. Um, yeah, we're not, we're not stuck 
we are grounded, but in, in, we're not glued. Does that make sense? Yeah. And, and I think too, like a huge piece too, which I should have mentioned first, but is the scripture, mm. like even just going back to those verses that are, you know, the Matthew 11, like come to me, I think it's oh, Matthew yes. 11, that come to me. Mm-hmm. Um, all you who are weary Turn, and like, come. yeah yeah so like yes. just it's like okay lord i'm just gonna park on this one verse and just rest you mm-hmm. know like finding those scriptures yeah super encouraging mm-hmm. you know, and life-giving and restores our soul mm-hmm. and turning them into breath prayers i love yeah. those yeah because yeah. yeah. sometimes especially with ocd it's so easy for for other words and thoughts to drown out prayers right yeah either fears right right like just like you just can't you can't find the space or the mental wherewithal yeah. <laughs> to, to, to phrase a whole prayer, right? So when I was introduced to the concept of, of breath prayers, I believe it was by Sarah Clarkson, actually, who also struggled with um, OCD and wrote yeah. that stunning book, This Beautiful Truth. Yes, so good. Yeah, yeah. so good. Um, um, but yeah, it, it, like the, the idea that you just take three or four words of scripture or just a request or even a praise sometimes and just repeat it over and over again, like, like you are good, Lord or be with me, Lord, or come to me, Lord, or turn my heart, Lord. You know, just like that, like, or Christ have mercy, you know, yeah. Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy. Yeah. Just those little things can really help those moments. And as we bring this around to close our episode, I really just want to talk just a, a, like a tiny bit more, just kind of wrap up the idea of why the sense of home and homemaking and art and beauty in that context is so important for every single Christian, child, adult, um, single person, married person, neither. I don't even know what that looks like. <laughs> why, why, is this, why is this important to us, right? How does this, again, using the word grounded, but how does this ground us? How does this place us as a character, right, in, in God's story? We are a part of a story. We're a character. Where are we and how does creating and making and carving out a space of goodness and beauty and rest in our homes help us to understand who we are as Christians and children of the Lord who started us in a garden and is bringing us into a city, into an ultimate home resting place? Yeah, that's good. No, I I do think that's important. And it is like our homes and our lives there. It's a picture. It's almost, you know, that shadow of what will be. And so I do think it is important. It's declaring to the world. It's declaring to our families, to ourselves, this great story that we are a part of. Mm. You know, and it is that um, that shadow. That's the best word that comes to mind of what will be. Yeah, I think of C.S. Lewis' Shadowlands. Almost like a, a reflection, and yet not because it's it's imperfect, right? Um, so you can almost think of it like you know, ripples on a pond, right? It's like, yeah. well, I can't really see my reflection, right? But I know there's something gorgeous up there. You know, I see like like images of the Milky Way, right? Like, yeah. There's a glow on the lake or yeah. whatever, and then I look up and I see the stars and the Milky Way, and looking down, I just see this like sparkly shimmer and it's moving and yeah. mystical. And yeah, when we look back someday. Our home life might be like, oh, what a cute dollhouse, <laughs> like you know. But but it was still, you know, we were aiming that way. That's really good. And you know, so then and and really just too like that every it's that sacramental thing too. Mm, like every mm-hmm. every meal that we make, every I love in the book. Edith talks about so many things we didn't even touch on. Mm-hmm. Like oh yeah, she talked about sketching and and um family drama Mm -hmm. little plays that you can write and and all these different sorts of things that every single one of those quote unquote natural and normal and everyday ordinary things Mm -hmm. it can be a sacramental thing that's pointing us to something to Mm -hmm. that great story reminding us that we are part of that great story so so lovely that we get to do that (laughs) i know it's a huge gift i think that's the other thing is it is a huge gift to be able to do that and and doing it is not just serving others, but it's serving ourselves because it's eternity ent- entering into time. Mm. You know, it's a it's part of who God is being allowed to, and by say allowed, I mean like we are giving him space to display his glory and his beauty and his peace and um, for us and for those around us. And I love that because I think sometimes we, we think that, that it's just us and someday we'll be with the sacred, right? And it's like, well, 
No, because like the sacred breaks into the, the secular and eternity breaks into time, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think cultivating a home is, is a huge part of what allows that to break into the mundane. Yeah. And it brings so much joy here and now. It does. Making outfits and breaking teacups. <laughs> Going to Goodwill. Yes. And flower arranging. And flower yes. Arranging. yes. yes. Pajamas it. and yes. pearls and slippers. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and retail therapy. <laughs> yeah. Goodwill, we broke a teacup. Oh, well. Time oh, to go buy right. another one. <laughs> yeah. Dog got it. <laughs> Love it. Well, this has been awesome. Thank you so much, Elise. Thank you. It's been so fun. But things are winding down at the Anselm Digital Pub. The fire is down to embers and the customers are trundling home. We have polished off our final glasses. Fanya. Earl Grey, all kinds of delicious things. Once again, Believe to See is a podcast of the Anselm Society Arts Guild. To find out more about the Anselm Society, please visit us at anselmsociety.org. And while you're at it, please rate and review the show on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you again next time. <laughs> <laughs>